Okay. Um, there is also a paper uh, that we will make available to you by Parker, and I'll try and put it up this week, uh, who used um, a tool that actually I used when I did my dissertation, you know, back in gray hair days. It's called Image J. It was developed by NIH, and uh, they developed a way to count um, to count bugs using it. And uh, we're excited. We are excited to see if someone wants to try and do that. Um, in our group. So I'll make that available as well. But those are two ways you can do it. The other way that you can do it is to make three. This is the way that people who are in mosquito uh, world do it. You make three dips that each dip is 300 milliliters, which is almost exactly a cup. And then you take the three dips, you count each dip, and then you divide by three. Um, you know, so that's a way to if you have to get a perfect number, um, you know, for our purposes, having a lot of mosquitoes and knowing what they are is really important. So one thing that I would like you to do is when you look at your mosquitoes, um, make sure that, you know, they're, they're one, if they are all once one, um, one taxon or not. So that's, um, that's one thing you can do, but we can talk more about this offline, but what a really interesting problem you have. All right, thank you. So I hope that helped, you know, and you are able to, you know, uh, in terms of counting, we don't have anything set up beyond if you have more than 100, put 100 in the app. And then uh, in the comments, you can say, you know, it looked like it was like 3000 or something. But we don't we don't um, use those numbers because we know that not everybody's going to be a great person at uh, coming up with an estimate. Okay. Great. So thanks a lot for your question. Right, thank you. Great. We're going to start in about three minutes, uh, Dr. Podes. We still have people coming into the room pretty actively. So um, uh, we're just going to wait until we stop adding people every minute. Um, I'm so excited to have this talk today. I think it's going to be really fun. Um, if you just got here, be sure to say who you are, where you are, and how things are going with your AOI or uh, your traps. And, um, you know, we're trying to get to know each other a little bit because we're going to start talking about doing group, group work next week. So uh, these are, this is one of the ways you can begin to find other people and learn about it. So I am not surprised there's a typo on the link on Canvas. Where is that? Uh, so I'll have to find out what that is about. Oh, on the link for this meet, really? Okay, thank you. That might be something we may wanna go in and change, Cassie, if you'd like to go do that. Oh, it should be slash my instead of my. Okay, that might've been me doing that. Well, hopefully you guys all know this, this Zoom by now because we do it all the time. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, well, it's slowing down just a little bit, people coming in. Uh, just take one or two more minutes, maybe. We'll start at, we'll start at 12.05. And uh, Okay, well, as we're getting the last few people into the room, um, I think I would like to very much introduce our guest speaker today, uh, one of your science mentors. Uh, this is Dr. Erica Podist. And Dr. Podist is a scientist with the Carbon Cycle and Ecosystems Group at uh, JPL, which is a uh, NASA facility out in California. Her research uh, focuses on using um, satellite data, particularly microwave sensors, uh, looking at wetland ecosystems, seas, uh, freeze and thaw dynamics. She's been looking at soils. She's got a lot to contribute. And she has also, um, early in her career, she worked with mosquitoes. And so that just kind of shows how mosquitoes are a really cool platform to begin um, your research if you want to go into NASA. 
So without further ado, I would like uh, Erica to uh, begin talking. Erica, thank you for coming today. And uh, we have a, a large group of students here that have uh, signed on to hear your talk. Great, thank you very much, uh, Rusty. I'm really excited to be here and to talk to you all about um, how to use satellite data to identify areas where you might have an abundance of mosquitoes. So let me just share my screen and let's see. Okay. There can we you, go. Can you see it? All right. Perfect. We can. Thank you. And can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. All right. So um, the, I, I am going to talk about identifying areas at risk for mosquitoes, uh, mosquito abundance with satellite data. And as Rusty mentioned, I am a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where I use satellite data to study our planet, specifically terrestrial ecosystems. And I use a type of um, sensor technology called microwave remote sensing. I'll talk a little bit about that. So before I start into my talk, I just wanna provide some background on, on me um, in terms of uh, where I'm from and why I'm interested in mosquitoes, actually. So I'm from a small country in Central America called Panama. I was born and raised there. And Panama is, as you all know, Panama has the, the Panama Canal, and it's got many other things. It's got like beautiful rainforest, and it's got um, beautiful beaches, and it also has a lot of mosquitoes. So I've um, and there are um, issues with some vector-borne diseases um, affecting part of the population of Panama. And so as I was growing up, I, I, had a, a, I always had this kind of natural curiosity as to what can be done to really um, decrease the incidence of these vector-borne diseases. And so actually, Panama, if you're, you're thinking of vector-borne diseases, it's a great example of uh, a country that was very much affected by a vector-borne disease. And when I talk about vector-borne diseases, these are diseases that are carried by a vector. In this case, they're mosquitoes. And since Panama is in the tropics, uh, you have, um, uh, you can find malaria and dengue and all of those tropical diseases that are carried by mosquitoes. And so back when the canal was started, this was uh, by the French, uh, the French uh, uh, invested a lot of money and effort into building the canal, but a large portion of the workers were dying because of disease, um, because of um, actually um, malaria and, and yellow fever. And they couldn't figure out what was, what, what was causing this disease. Um, and actually malaria it was called malaria. It came from the French term mal air, which means bad air. They, they thought it was just this humid um, air in the tropics that, that was not good for the workers and they were dying. And it wasn't until um, uh, an, an American um, doctor working in Cuba uh, who, and, and the Cuban doctors that determined that um, malaria was actually transmitted by a mosquito. So, so the French couldn't go on constructing the canal. They were just losing too much money and uh, because they, they didn't have the, the workforce. And, and so the Americans came in and bought the rights to the canal. And the first thing the Americans did was they put a, a little tank on every worker and that tank, at the time, it contained uh, you know, these, these heavy pesticides, DDT, and they, they basically sprayed every puddle um, in the country or around the canal area. And they essentially eradicated the disease overnight. And then they were able to come in and, and, build, and finish building the canal. So that's the story of, uh, of Panama and tropical diseases. Anyway, I'm from this fascinating country. 
And I, I since a, a young age, I've been um, very much um, interested in not only nature and, and, and mosquitoes and, and just anything science was really of interest to me. And so I love technology and I noticed like there was this amazing lush tropical forest that was surrounding me. And I always had a curiosity about uh, the mechanisms, how, how these tropical forests work, um, the relationship between the forest and the, the, the animals that live there. So I, I knew I wanted something that studied forest and our natural environment, but I also love technology. So I went into engineering and then from engineering, I focused on this area called remote sensing, which is the study of our planet by satellites. And I got an internship at NASA at the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And really that was my kind of key in the door. Um, that was my first opportunity. That was, that was um, yeah, that, that was the, the opportunity for me to come work there and really show my mentors and, and peers that um, I, I, I really wanted to stay there, you know? So, so one opportunity led to another until I became a scientist at JPL. And, and really the bottom line is here is that, you know, you, you really, in, internships are really important and they can really open opportunities for you in the future and really allow you to um, see whether you like a specific area of, um, of research or, or area of focus in, in your professional career. Um, and so even if you don't like it though, it's always very important to give it your best because um, recommendation letters are very, very important in your career. And so wherever you do these internships, um, you'll need recommendation letters for whatever next step you take in your life. Okay, so um, I started at JPL um, studying tropical forests using satellite data, and I've done many things since then. Uh, but, but I've actually always focused on terrestrial ecosystems. And I just want to give you a little overview of the fleet of satellites that we have in space. Um, so these are the satellites that NASA has in space. Uh, right now, NASA has 23 sensors in space, and I call them sensors because they're not all standalone satellites. We have actually six sensors on the International Space Station. And these sensors, they study the different components of our Earth's environment as related to the oceans, the land, and the atmosphere. And then together they provide this big picture perspective of our earth as a system. And these satellites also allow us to monitor our planet. And that's really the most important part to really monitor on a continuous basis our, our, our precious planet to understand how it's changing and potentially um, um, better be able to inform decisions into what we should be doing differently. So one of the missions I've worked on, and oh, one thing I forgot to mention is those satellites that you saw and then those sensors in space, those are just the NASA satellites. It's what, one key thing for us is that there are many other satellites in space from many other space agencies and international collaboration is really important. So in my research, I not only use data from NASA satellites, but I use data from other space agencies, you know, because when you're talking about climate change, uh, it goes beyond borders. So international collaboration is extremely important. And NASA actually partners with many different space agencies to send satellites into space. So one of the satellites I worked on was called SMAP. And SMAP uh, is, uh, stands for the Soil Moisture Active Passive Satellite. And it launched in space, uh, well, we launched it into space in 2015. And so this satellite, can you hear the audio? Is that coming across for the video? No. No, okay. Well, there's some cool background music, but this gives you a little sense of what the satellite does. Great.
So that gives you a sense of the focus of the satellite, soil moisture. So you think, why, why is soil moisture important? And so it's important for many things. And uh, the, the video touched on some of those things. But before I get into that, I just wanted to show some pictures. Since I worked on the satellite, there's always kind of the science part. And when you turn on the TV, you see a, a news clip about NASA launching a satellite into space. And it all seems so easy. But it's not. It's actually very difficult to put things into space. Space is a very harsh environment. You need to um, uh, uh, you need to build special satellites. They're not off the shelf parts. You need to ruggedize your your system. Space has um, intense radiation. It has intense temperatures, very cold and then very hot. Uh, you got a lot of vibrations as you're sending the satellite into space. You know, on a rocket, it's vibrating. So you really need to test the whole system and make sure everything works and. I mean, this gives these pictures kind of give you a sense of all of the electronics in the system. And so this is the clean lab at JPL as the satellite was being assembled. And uh, for reference on the right side, you have a, a person standing next to it. So you, you get a sense of um, just the size of the satellite. And so one of the unique parts of the satellite is um, you can see there's this antenna. And so that antenna allows us to make this large footprint on on the surface of the earth and observe the surface of the earth. And at the time it was the largest spinning antenna that NASA had ever launched. It's uh, six meters in, in diameter. And again, you have a person here and it gives you a sense of just how large that antenna is with state of the art components um, that to make it very, very light. So all of that had to be kind of stowed into a satellite. And, and so it, it folded like a camp chair, you know? And, um, and, and then it was deployed in space. But um, just, just the latest state of the art materials and, and technologies to make this happen, you know, and, and be able to measure soil moisture from space. So now let's talk a little bit about um, soil moisture and the importance of soil moisture. I mean, why put a satellite in space that measures soil moisture? Um, so um, obviously the water in the soil is, is is very important because uh, plants need water to grow. And so the amount of water in the soil really drives the growth of plants. And if we're thinking about food, then that's really, really important. And so um, soil moisture does vary depending on the type of soil. And so here you have just a, a, a reference of like a column of soil and the topmost soil that's hummus, that's a very rich organic layer. And then as you go down, you've got these, what's called different horizons. So um, then you've got the topsoil, the A horizon, which is still rich in, in hummus and minerals. And then you've got um, less organic material, the further you go down and coarser particles, the further you go down until you hit the bedrock. And so soil is basically composed of organic material. You know, you've got these, these grains of, of, of minerals, and you've got a lot of air pockets. And so the water is stored in those air pockets. And, and so that's what we're measuring from space. And so moisture really varies a lot depending on um, the conditions on the, the ground, whether you have vegetation, whether it's bare, or whether you have vegetation, you know, tall vegetation or grasses, topography, you know, the slope is going to influence um, how much uh, water in the soil is retained because the slopier it is, the, the more it'll, it'll just um, uh, run down the slope, right? In flat areas, it will accumulate. And then soil texture. Uh, so, soils that are sandy tend to uh, drain water much quicker than very clay soils. And you've probably experienced this. Um, um, and it, whether you have a garden or if you go to the beach, you see the, the tide come in and it's it, the, the, the sand looks wet. And then as the tide runs down, you know, it's, it's dry. It, I mean, it, it drains very quickly. So if you think of the distribution of water on, on earth, most of the water on earth is actually salt water. It's 97% of the water on earth is salt water and 3% is fresh water. And so of that 3% that's fresh water, most of it is either in the ground or it's frozen in ice caps and glaciers. So of all of that fresh water, 0.9% is surface water, um, of which most of it is in lakes and then swamps and rivers. So really, 
um, in terms of what's in the soil, it's a very small amount, but it's really, really important for um, the, the water cycle, the carbon cycle, and the energy cycle. So I'll, I'll skip through this. But um, one of the things that the satellite does is it measures soil moisture every three days globally. And the reason we're measuring it every three days is because soil moisture is very dynamic and um, it changes, uh, it can change very quickly depending on the temperature, depending on the vapor pressure deficit, depending on the type of vegetation, depending on many things. But this is just a chart to show that if you sample, the black line is continuous measurements of soil moisture. The blue inverted triangle is um, sampling soil moisture every seven days, and the red inverted triangles is sampling of soil moisture every two and a half days. So you see what happens is you've got these rain events, and so you've got a sudden increase in soil moisture, and then it, there's these, um, these, these dry down periods, right? So if you sample every seven days, you can essentially miss those important wetting and drying periods. But if you sample every two and a half days, you, you're kind of getting that dynamic nature of soil moisture. And so that's why SMAP is sampling every um, three days. Actually, in some areas, it's better. And so before SMAP, the, this is a, um, so these are ground stations in the United States um, where they're measuring soil moisture. So basically, there's a sensor on the ground where soil moisture is being measured. And really the United States um, is the, or was the, the most, um, um, the, the country with the most measurements of soil moisture in situ. However, the issue with in situ or in, in place is that it's not really representative of the soil moisture around you, depending on the conditions. I mean, you might have a mountain, you might have, um, varying conditions just a couple of kilometers away and it might be dry here or it might be wet here and that might not be the case if you go three kilometers five kilometers away and so that's why it's really important to be able to measure this from space so how do you measure soil moisture from space that's a yeah that's a challenge that's a the great question is um you're all familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum so you've got the distribution of energy right and so you've got uh, different frequencies. And I th think of them as wavelengths. So one of them is in the range in the microwave range. And when, uh, so we use microwave, we, we SMAP uses a sensor that operates in the microwave range, it's called the radiometer. And that is collecting the emissions that are being emitted from the earth. And that those emissions have information on soil moisture. Um, so think of it as like a thermal camera, like if you point a thermal camera at someone, you've got like temperature, yeah. And so in this case, we're not really, so what the, sorry, what the thermal camera is doing is it's collecting those emissions in the um, thermal uh, range from a, coming from a person. And in the case of microwave, we're collecting emissions coming from the earth in the microwave range in a specific, uh, part of the microwave range. And so it's indirectly related, soil moisture is indirectly related to the temperature. And so, um, so we use, so SMAP uses um, kind of two approaches. One is a passive. So as I said, it's like a thermal camera and it's sensing the emissions from the uh, surface of the earth. And another one is called active where we send a signal and that signal interacts with the different components of the land surface. And then part of it bounces back to the satellite. And that signal that bounces back to the satellite has information within it about the moisture conditions, the wetness in the surface of the earth. So, so this is kind of just an illustration of how the satellite works. It sends a signal, that's the active, here's the passive, so we're sensing the emissions. And one of the, pot, the great things about using microwave is you can actually go through clouds. So it's similar to an ultrasound where um, you're sending a signal and then collecting what's being scattered um, in terms of the active part. 
the thermal is more uh, similar to a thermal camera. Okay, and another great thing about using microwave is that it penetrates through the vegetation canopy so we can sense the soil moisture conditions underneath the vegetation canopy. Um, okay, so I, this just summarizes the advantages of, um, uh, of using a microwave remote sensing, penetrates clouds, penetrates the canopy, actually penetrates the soil. So you can actually, we're, we're actually with SMAP sensing the top five centimeters of the soil. Um, so we are, uh, uh, we're sensitive to soil moisture in the top five centimeters overall. And this is an animation of SMAP uh, through time. So this is 2015 and you can see some interesting things. Um, over land, yellow is very dry and dark blue is, is very wet. And so here, look at India, you've got the onset of the monsoon season around July and it's just, it becomes all very blue right there. Um, and back in 2015, there were also some floods in, in, in South America around here and in the Gulf area. So you can pick all of those things up. And so what SMAP allows us to do is not only see like this, this natural wetting, these, these, like the monsoon is, is a natural phenomenon, but we can also see um, flood events and it, it allows us to monitor uh, droughts. So it's really important for many different things. I'll briefly touch on these. One of them is weather prediction. So if you know the amount of water in the soil, that water can potentially evaporate, right? And so when you, for weather prediction, soil moisture is really important because if the conditions are right, if the temperature is right, then that water in the soil, when it evaporates, it plays a, lo uh, a role in cloud formation and in um, modulating temperature and humidity. Flood prediction, if you know the amount of water in the soil and if you know that there is a big rainstorm coming then and, and say your soil is near saturation, then that area might be at risk for flooding. Drought, uh, you can, these are very slow going events, but uh, you can monitor droughts, the extent of droughts, whether it's intensifying. Um, so you can really um, uh, kind of see the direction that a drought is moving in. Crop yield, as mentioned at the beginning, water needs, uh, uh, plants need water to grow. And um, there are many models to predict what the yield will be at the end of the season. And these models need many different types of information. And so um, one of the information, one of the most important parts, it's, um, it's, it's soil moisture. And then the important one here is vector-borne diseases. And so mosquitoes need a range of different conditions to, um, to, 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 to thrive. And, and so soil moisture is one of them. As you know, mosquitoes love like really wet conditions. And so if you have, you can bring in different information on temperature and humidity and, um, and rainfall and soil moisture, for example, you can better constrain the conditions that are ideal for mosquitoes. Okay, so we're not seeing the mosquitoes, but we're identifying the ideal conditions where you would expect to find mosquitoes. And these can vary, these conditions. It depends on the mosquito. Some mosquitoes have different temperature ranges. Some mosquitoes have different um, uh, 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 min and max temperature ranges. Some, some like clean water, others like dirty water. It just depends on, on the mosquito. So here, I just wanna talk to you about a little um, research uh, that I did a couple of years ago, and this was part of the DEVELOP program. And this is a great program that NASA has for students to work on a project. And usually these projects um, are, are supported by multiple students. So you have one project and multiple students support different aspects of the project. And this was a project I think back in 2014, together with a colleague, Darren Drury. Um, and so we were looking at, can we bring in different satellite data um, and identify what is the driver of some of the spikes in, in this case, dengue. So dengue is a vector-borne disease. And 
It, it, it claims millions of lives annually. Um, it's the, 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 one of the world's fastest growing vector-borne diseases. And um, at least what well, we're talking about 10 years, uh, 11 years ago, 980,000 cases of dengue were reported in, in just Brazil. Um, there is no vaccine for dengue. And you have different types of dengue. You have different types of, um, I think three or four different types of, uh, 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 of strains of dengue. And depending on the one that you get, it can be mild where you have a headache and, and some muscle and joint pain or others that can actually cause that. So, so how can we then, what can we bring in? What sort of information? And so for this project, we didn't use soil moisture. SMAP wasn't up in space, but we did use a couple of other environmental um, information that can be assessed from satellites. And this was, um, we, we used temperature and humidity from uh, NASA's aqua air sensors. Uh, we used vegetation information, and that was from uh, the motor sensor on board also the, the aqua satellite. Um, precipitation data from TRIM, uh, surface inundation, um, this was from uh, QuickScat. And, and so what we did was we looked at the correlations between these different variables and dengue outbreaks. So we were able to obtain the dengue outbreaks from the Ministry of Health from Brazil. And what we did is we acquired all of these variables um, for the period of 2003 to 2013 over Brazil. And we converted the data, we averaged the data for each of the different um, provinces in Brazil. So we applied a statistical approach where we calculated anomalies for each of these variables. So what is an anomaly? What we did is, so we have a period from 2003 to 2013, that's 10 years. And we calculated the average for each province for each month, okay? So, so here what you're seeing is, uh, sorry, for, for each year, okay? So, for, we calculated the average for each month for each year to create an overall January average for each of the different um, provinces. And then we also, or states in, um, in Brazil. And then we created the anomaly by subtracting the specific um, average for a month to the overall average. Okay, so that, doing that, we generated these, what we call anomaly uh, graphs for each of our variables. Let me just show you some of the results. So here we have surface temperature on the top. Um, here in blue, we have relative humidity. And then down here, you have the outbreak. Okay, so these are the, the anomalies. And so what you're seeing down here is that around this period in 2009, 2010, actually between 2010 and 2011, there was a large outbreak of dengue fever in the state of Sao Paulo. And so we looked at the relative humidity and surface temperature, and we noticed that there was a large anomaly in surface temperature and in relative humidity. So surface temperature was below normal, and um, the relative humidity was higher than normal. And so, so this was interesting because, um, so because there was an unusually cool event and an unusually humid event. Um, however, there is a lag, right, between the outbreak and the anomaly, which is expected. I mean, you don't expect to see suddenly, you know, um, the, these environmental events, and then suddenly you have an outbreak. The, usually there, there's a lag, and that lag can be one to two months. 
So in this case, what we also explored was the effects of those time lags. And we looked at correlations between temperature and outbreaks here on the left and humidity and outbreaks on the right. And, and so what we saw was that um, there is a, a you, know, you have to account for the lags in order to find these correlations. And so there is a correlation and it, uh, sorry, uh, the black line is um, the day, day temperature. The blue line is the night temperature and the green line is the day night difference. So we found a strong correlation um, between um, these, between uh, temperature, in this case, the night temperature and dengue outbreaks. And we also found a strong correlation between humidity um, in the night and actually in, in the day um, and dengue outbreaks. So overall correlations peak at two to three months for temperature and one to two months for humidity. The interesting thing, and I am not showing it here, is that in some cases, you know, obviously mosquitoes and, and, and the, the abundance of mosquitoes is related to a couple of things, temperature, precipitation, many different things. But what we saw in some cases is that some provinces or some states were already very wet. So really, um, differences in precipitation or anomalies in precipitation didn't really make a difference in mosquito abundance, or in this case, in outbreaks. But differences in temperature had a strong impact on the outbreaks. In other cases, um, you might have seen that the temperature was, uh, the, 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 some states were, um, had a strong seasonality in terms of the, its rain events. And so temperature was more or less normal and you might have had some anomalies like some hot days, but really what was driving the outbreak was the precipitation event. So it, it really varied and it depend on the baseline conditions for these different areas. So in terms of accessing this data, um, there's the, the um, there's an the peers website, and there's also a Giovanni website. And I want to show you those websites um, in case you're interested in exploring the satellite data and doing some sort of similar analysis. So peers is a website. Can you see my my browser? So let me just reshare to make sure that I can share my, uh, my browser with you. Okay, here. Yes, thank so, you. So here we have, um, so Appears is a great um, online tool where you can uh, mine uh, satellite data. And you do need to set up an account and setting up an account is free, but you do have to register your name and your email address. And so when you, once you have that, you go to your area, say the area where, you're, um, uh, where you have your mosquito traps, right? And so you say, okay, what is the lat long of that area? And then you can extract information related to temperature um, for that area. Or you can also measure temperature for that area where you have your mosquito trap. So let's see. There. Okay, so I've, I've, I'm already logged into the system. So what you do is select point sample, or you can also select an area. And let's just say this is a mosquito point sample. And then you enter the date, the date range that is of interest to you. So let's just go from April 1st through June 15th. And then you need to select your area, right? Where you want this data extracted. So what this 
tool will do is it will extract the variable that you specify for your area of interest. So what you do is you zoom in here in the map. So let's zoom in. It's, uh, it's a bit clunky here uh, with my mouse. So let me just zoom out manually. And then select this add a coordinate and you can drop it wherever you want. And it tells you the lat long, right? Or you can also, if you know the lat long, you can just type it up here, okay? So this happens to be the lat long where I dropped that point. All right. So then what you do, it says select the layers to include in the sample. What you can extract from up here is, is uh, temperature data. So surface temperature. And when you type in temperature, you have a bunch of different temperature variables from um, from different sensors in space. So here you have MODIS, land surface temperature and emissivity, uh, one kilometer daily product from 2000 to present. Here you have a one kilometer every eight day product. Um, and so this is from MODIS. This is from 2002 to present. So what I suggest is use the aqua land surface temperature. Um, you can use daily surface temperature. I think that's better. And then basically for every file, you've got some ancillary information. Um, that's not really necessary for, for what you'll be doing. But what you want is LST stands for land surface temperature. And what you want is, you want both the day and the night and you wanna compare. I mean, it's really important when you're talking about like mosquito, the presence of mosquitoes, it's not really necessarily the average daily temperature but you really wanna look at the min and the max um, because it might be that they have a certain tolerance for how cold temperature gets or how hot it gets. So you really want to look at, at, those, at, at those extremes. Okay, so you want to look at the, 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 the daytime and the nighttime. Uh, you, look at, you look at the min and the max. So let's just go with that and that. And then you submit, and I think you can download it immediately. So you can download it as a CSV file. Let's see. Okay, it says here, you get an email, uh, uh, a notice saying the point sample request was successfully submitted and an email notification will be delivered once the request is complete. So you'll get an email with a link that um, will uh, take you to where you can download the data. And it's, a, it's an, a file that you can open in Excel. So also you can, um, we talked about soil moisture. So even though in the example, I didn't have soil moisture, but you can use SMAP soil moisture and you can extract that through this tool as well. And so when you type in soil moisture, you have different products from SMAP. And the one that you'll want to use is the SMAP enhanced level three radiometer soil moisture. So it's a nine kilometer daily product. And once you click on that, 
um, again, the files that are associated with that file pop up. And the ones that you want to select is the soil moisture retrieval data AM. Okay, so select that. And you can then explore that specific variable. Now for other things like uh, precipitation or humidity, there's another tool called Giovanni. And um, it's similar to appears, it's a little, um, maybe not as user-friendly, but you can, if you want precipitation data, you type precipitation in, in the uh, keyword. And you'll have a long list of all of the different uh, precipitation data sets available from either satellite um, observations or from model estimates. So what you wanna do is you wanna go to, we'll use one called iMERGE. So let's do this. Okay, so type in iMerge and what you'll want to use is the the daily accumulated precipitation late run. Sorry, this one, the multi-satellite precipitation estimate with gauge calibration final run. Okay, so it's recommended for general use. That's the data set you wanna use for precipitation. And then up here, you define your date range and your, um, your area or your point of interest. Okay, so um, hopefully this gives you a, an idea of what you could potentially do with satellite data, what you can explore, different variables, and, um, and how you could uh, potentially bring those with the mosquito trap information that you're collecting or that has already been collected. So with that, I'm open to your questions. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Potus. And we have a bunch of questions in the chat and I would love it if people would um, step into the queue, raise your hand and ask these questions directly to Erica. And Nadini uh, stepped up first. Nadini, go ahead, please. Um, okay, so I had a question um, uh, on the electro. So, like, how these satellites um, get the uh, wave, the microwaves, and when they're reflected back, since there's so many electromagnetic waves and microwaves in, um, you know, going around our Earth, how does the satellite? Um, how are they trained to only pick up the waves that they? that were reflected back by the soil? That's a great question. So basically, we kind of have a, we know what we're sending. It's like sending, throwing a ball and that ball has a little marker on it. So we, we so yes, yeah, so, so it's, it's the source energy that's being emitted from the satellite. But sometimes you also get interference actually. And uh, there are ways to kind of filter that out, but it's not always easy. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to Andrew. I know Nadini will try and get back to your next question too, but Andrew, do you want to um, ask your question? Yeah, if the 
land cover or soil is very wet. How does that impact the backscatter and does that negatively harm the satellite data that you're observing? Um, how does it impact the backscatter? So when the soil is very wet, uh, it increases the backscatter so there, because there's more reflectivity. Um, so it doesn't harm the, the data in terms of overwhelming the data. Is that what you're saying? Like it's just super bright. Is that what you're saying? And it just overwhelms everything? It doesn't, uh, in fact. Um, it's, it's not very bright. But if you look like a, a time series of the same patch that's, that's dry and it continuously gets wet or wetter, the soil gets wetter, then you'll see that there's an increase in, in backscatter. So that's the active part. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nicole. Uh, I just had like a follow-up question from like when you answered uh Nandini's I don't want to mispronounce it uh question so you mentioned that you do encounter interference and I was just wondering like how big of an issue is that and are you working to like fix it so you don't have it as much and so it's not affecting the data as much or yeah so that's a, a great question so we're actually transmitting in, in a very specific frequency and so we're collecting the the signal that is returning kind of in, in, that, in that frequency. And, and so, yeah, there is interference and we have tried to tune, fine tune that specific frequency to areas where there is least interference. So that's kind of the filter, um, but we can't get rid of all of it. And there have been other satellite missions that this has been a very big issue. We're not really sure what the source of the interference is in different places. like. Um, in Japan, for example, there's there's quite a bit coming from Japan and some islands in the Caribbean. It might be like a communication systems or cell phones. We're not entirely sure. So what we try to do is, is just fine tune it a little differently, same way you tune your radio. Like you just tune it a little knob and, and you find another, um, uh, another um, radio channel. So we try to fine tune it to where you'll find the least interference. That's the best we can do. Great, thank you. Uh, Corbin. So this also plays in a little bit to the last question. Um, is there a way, I'm not sure really how to say this. It, do you think that the technology will improve or it can improve and get much better either by a different method or will technology just get better to where you can get rid of that? And are you gonna do that with the current satellite do you think or will there be a new one going up soon? Yeah, so SMAP is actually an improvement. There was a, there's one uh, satellite that does similar measurements to SMAP. It's called um, SMOS, and that's from the European Space Agency. They had large, very big issues with interference. <clears throat> and so what SMAP did was learn from them and actually put this filter where um, it collected uh, data in slightly different frequencies. And the frequency where there was least interference, then that was kind of the frequency that has been used to um, to to collect there on the, uh, the the satellite the, the data where we um, extract soil moisture from. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, go ahead and raise your hand if you have other questions, and I'm going to ask Anna's question right now. Uh, she uh, typed in, "Could you use measures of soil moisture as a proxy for human health?" Does it correlate with the spread of disease, for instance? Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, a proxy for human health. In fact, there was one project for, from SMAP that was looking at the incidence of these dust storms in the Middle East. And so when the soil, the sand um, is very dry and you have these storms coming through, uh, the drier that soil is, the more sand is gonna be picked up and carried. You know? So, so looking at soil moisture um, was actually um, a way to determine um, how far that sand might be, how much sand might be picked up, how far might it be blown, and what the impact might be on human health in other areas in the region. 
So yes, in, in that case, it's a proxy in, in, and for mosquitoes, it's also um, uh, not a proxy, but, but another variable, another piece in the puzzle to really characterize the habitats for mosquitoes. Just wonderful, thank you. Uh, Anna, you have another question? Um, yeah, so I was just wondering if there's any um, correlation that you found while studying like, um, because um, I know you were talking about how like soil moisture correlates with the spread of disease um, and different factors like vegetation. Is there anything that you found like a correlation that surprised you the most? Not really. I mean, I think what surprised us the most was that there wasn't one thing necessarily. It just depends on the baseline conditions of those places. Um, as I said, if, if it's a place that's relatively um, uh, wet already and you have these big shifts in temperature, then that's going to drive the this explosion of mosquitoes potentially, right? But in other places where you already have um, uh, um, where it, it might be the other way around where it's precipitation, the one that's driving this explosion of mosquitoes. So it depends. And it, I mean, it's complex because these mosquitoes have different, um, different conditions and they develop these, um, uh, they, they, uh, they develop resistance or, or they, they become adjusted to different climatic conditions. So you might find the same type of mosquito that now has developed these, um, this, this adaptation to like a larger temperature range or colder temperatures or warmer temperatures. So it's, it's, it's really complex. And something about dengue, dengue is actually an, more of an urban disease. And one thing we saw in some places, like for example, um, in Ethiopia, and this didn't really make sense at the beginning, is that we were seeing that there was an outbreak of dengue in the dry season, which was odd because it's already it's very dry, and 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 you know in the dry season it doesn't rain, temperatures are are are, are um, they're warm, but it doesn't really rain. It's everything is very dry. But what was happening is in the dry season, people accumulate water in these tanks, right? And so there was a, um, a, 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 a um, an, an abundant, we saw an abundance of mosquitoes in the dry season because people, because of, of human behavior, basically. So there's the, the human behavior part, right? The, the human practices, and there's also like the environmental conditions. Excellent answer. It really is complex. Uh, Aria, go ahead. How does Matt know that um, the moisture and the like the water, not the water, the light that they're receiving comes from the soil and not like the vegetation? That's a great question. That's a great question. So we use algorithms to uh, estimate or, or measure soil moisture and. Um, the algorithms use information to inform it. And one of the information layers, what we call, is um, the type of vegetation that's there. So if you think the signal, it's, it has information, the signal that's arriving to a satellite, it has information about the moisture in the soil, but it has also, also has information about vegetation. So you kind of have to tease out the part that belongs to vegetation to get to the information that's uh, that's about the soil. So 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 yeah, these are algorithms that um, take into account vegetation, the soil texture, many different information that will affect the signal. So you tease out these different components to get to soil moisture. Wonderful. Uh, Anna has another question here. Um, so this might have like a few questions. So um, I was wondering, is there anything you wish would be maybe improved about like satellite data measurements, maybe about the satellite data? Um, I mean, maybe the satellites themselves or even about the way we measure them <clears throat> or if there are like any pressing problems that you see right now in terms of satellite data measurements? 
Yeah, that's a, another great question. So satellites, they're measuring many different things, right? And so um, sometimes like satellites, how can I, I best put this? Um, some satellites have a specific focus. MAP has a specific focus to measure soil moisture. I wish ideal is if we had soil moisture not at three kilometer resolution, spatial resolution, but at at um, 50 meter spatial resolution, you know? Um, so, but there are other satellites that don't necessarily um, have, are, are made to measure certain things, but you use the data to measure that. Um, so one is the data that one is the observation and the other one is the product that you generate from the observation you need algorithms to to generate that product um, so so yeah it's it, it's a hard question to answer because it depends what you want to observe right but usually the issue is you don't have the observation at a high enough or the spatial resolution that you would like or the temporal resolution that you would like. Uh, we got a couple more questions and we're wrapping up here. Uh, Corbin, do you wanna ask your question? Yes, ma'am. So what makes microwaves so good for soil moisture mapping? What is it, like why would you take microwaves over some other wavelength? What makes that preferable? Yeah, that's a great question. So microwaves are very much sensitive to what's called the dielectric properties of the land surface, um, including the soil. Dielectric means the amount of water that's there, okay? Um, and so that is one reason why microwave is great for looking at soil moisture. The other reason is it can see through clouds. Clouds are usually a big problem. If you go to Google Earth, uh, you might, yeah, you'll see that there are clouds over certain areas. And, and this is an issue because you can't really monitor the same area in a continuous basis because there's clouds. Microwaves pen penetrate through clouds and they also penetrate through soil. So you, you're not only seeing maybe the, the soil moisture condition on the top of the soil, but you're actually assessing the soil moisture conditions through uh, the top layer of the soil. In the case of SMAP, the uh, on average, the top five centimeters. Great. All, All right. right. Thank you. Good. Let's do one more question, Andrew. Uh, what would happen if there's a like a gap in your data? For example, you were looking at images every three to four days, but something happens with the satellite and a few images don't get processed in a row. Do you use information from another satellite with similar properties, or do you try to fill in the gap with other data? Yeah, no, that these are all great questions. It does happen. Sometimes the satellite, there's there's a glitch with the sensor or um, something, and usually there are gaps. Yeah, we we don't we don't um, it, it's not filled with data from another satellite. It's just if you want to fill it, you can go to that other satellite and, and fill it, but but it's just left as a gap usually. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Um uh, before we go, we just have a couple more minutes, Erica, and I was wondering if you could just uh, talk about your personal experience with DEVELOP, um, because all these folks are potential are potential candidates for being DEVELOP interns um, in a year or so. And uh, I just wonder if you would like to talk just a little bit about your personal experience with that, that what kind of science did you come in with it? Um, and um, what was your team composed of? Just to give a little bit of an idea about that experience. Yeah, absolutely. So I've actually been involved with two develop uh, projects. Um, one was this mosquito project and the other one was one in Panama looking at um, the amount of water use uh, by different types of vegetation in the tropics. And so each of these developed projects consisted of four students. And um, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience because students brought in different kind of strengths. And so every project has so many different parts, so many different components. So we, 
uh, these these projects play to the students' strengths, and also, I mean, it's it's a it's a place for the students to grow, but um, in the area that that they're most suited to, and so in both projects, you had students supporting these different components of the project, and um, it was a great interaction. The program has the program itself has a lot of um, deliverables, so you you have to um, put a, a, a present poster presentation together. Um, I think you need to make a video um, at the end. You need to make a presentation. Some of these things have changed, but you also need to work in in teams. So it's not just about you doing your own thing. You need to be constantly communicating with the other students and with your mentors. So overall, it's a great experience for for growth, for building new skills, for building leadership. I highly, highly recommend it. Wonderful. Okay, um, Anna asked one more question, but I think that, uh, and it's about the uh, role that a, a satellite data has been, um, what role has it had and how effective has it been in improving human health? And I, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to answer that question. Um, I'm gonna type a URL in uh, because uh, in fact, uh, NASA Applied Science has been looking at human health for you know better than a decade, looking at vector-borne disease, um, looking at uh, air pollution, water, qual uh, water quality, land, um, air quality, all these things. So I'm gonna put this uh, URL um, in the chat so that you all can go and read more about that. But um, I would really like to thank our uh, speaker today, Erica. Erica, that was such a such a fun talk, and I really appreciate you taking the time to walk us through the um, the appears tool and the uh, Giovanni tool. You know, one thing that's really exciting: we had uh, Dr. Jeff Luval talk last week, and he was talking about how when he started doing this work, it cost four thousand dollars to get a satellite scene. Um, you know. And you know, uh, when I started doing work, you know, you had to have a, a mega computer at a research facility in order to download this data. And now it still takes a little bit of time, as Matteo can attest. But you know, at the appears we have now all these web services that are providing this data for us, and you can do this kind of research remotely, which is one of the reasons that um, this remote team is is now really possible. So I really want to thank you for showing those data data sets. And we are really hoping that um, that Erica will have a little bit more time for us in a few weeks uh, to talk more to you as you get your research projects together. And so Erica, you will be hearing from me um, about that, but thank you so much for uh, this wonderful talk today. And uh, I just wanted to let people know that uh, the next thing that's on your docket is at 6 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, the peer mentors are going to be giving a, um, they're gonna be hosting the Meetup and Do Science. And they're gonna talk a little bit about how they got involved in setting up their groups, what the research might look like that you're gonna be doing and, and these kinds of things. So uh, please, um, please attend that session. And uh, thank you uh, so much. Oh, and Nicole said, I just sent her just her the link to applied sciences so i'm going to put that in there for everybody sorry about that sometimes if i'm not paying attention it changes it to direct message for me so uh yeah. so thank you very much and uh, and feel free to send me any uh, send me an email if you have any questions about any of the material i presented or any questions about accessing the data on uh, at the two tools i presented Great, and we'll make sure that Erica, that we bring you back into the group when people are beginning to de design their projects uh, for some uh, for some input, because I know you've got some great ideas. Thank you All very right. much, Russ. Well, thank you. All right, ha everyone have a good afternoon and uh, we'll see some of you uh, when hopefully most of you uh, Wednesday evening. Bye. Thank All you. Bye.